Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. You may be seated. The Christian life is a life of dependence on God. And I don't mean that we occasionally need God's help, as if most of the time we're self-sufficient. I mean that the Christian life is a life of complete and constant dependence on God, like the life of an infant. And this is the image that David uses in Psalm 22. You made me trust you at my mother's breasts. The helpless, suckling babe is a picture of our utter dependence on God. In today's Gospel reading, we see that it's much easier to acknowledge this dependence in the midst of distress than in the midst of joy. Or, to put it another way, we find it much easier to pray than to give thanks. Well, let's hear what happened. On the way to Jerusalem, Jesus was passing along between Samaria and Galilee, and as he entered a village, he was met by ten lepers. Lepers had it rough, to state the obvious. First there was the disease itself, which corrupted and consumed the flesh, very much like rotting while you were still alive. And then there were the social consequences of the disease, which the Lord lays out in Leviticus chapter 13. The leprous person who has the disease shall wear torn clothes, and let the hair of his head hang loose, and he shall cover his upper lip and cry out, Unclean! Unclean! He shall remain unclean as long as he has the disease. He is unclean, he shall live alone, his dwelling shall be outside the camp. The leper was cut off from the society of men, which adds enough misery to the disease. But worst of all, being unclean meant that the leper could not come to the tabernacle or the temple and appear before God. He could not participate in the appointed feasts. He could not draw near and see the Lord's grace in the sacrifices. He was cut off from God himself with no comfort from mankind, and a raging disease in his flesh. Now, while leprosy is an actual disease, and while Jesus did actually cleanse the ten lepers in today's reading, leprosy is, at the same time, a good picture of sin. Now, we usually understand well enough what actual sin is. And by that phrase, actual sin, I don't mean real sin as opposed to unreal sin. Actual sin refers to sin of action. When we do something that God has commanded us not to do, or when we don't do something that God has commanded us to do. But even worse than our actual sins, the sins of act, is original sin. And leprosy is an excellent picture of that. The phrase original sin refers to the fact that ever since the sin of Adam and Eve, we have been by nature sinful. We are not conceived and born sinless and then only become sinners later when we commit actual sins. Rather, it's as David says in Psalm 51, Behold, I was brought forth in iniquity, and in sin did my mother conceive me. Sin resides in our flesh like a spiritual leprosy, corrupting the way that God created our nature to be. <coughs> and you heard some of the things that this sinful flesh desires in Galatians chapter 5. Things like sexual immorality, idolatry, jealousy, anger, and things like these. This corruption of the flesh means that we were unclean. We were by nature 
cut off from God and children of wrath, even if we never committed any actual sins. Though, it's impossible for us not to commit actual sins. We are, by nature, sinful, and therefore we will act according to our nature. Having a sinner who didn't sin would be like having water that isn't wet, or fire that isn't hot. It just cannot be. And this all comes back to this leprous corruption that rages in our flesh. And therefore, when we see the ten lepers in today's reading, we can see ourselves. Now, you've heard how the law required the lepers to keep away from people and shout out, unclean, unclean. But that's not quite ha what happened in today's reading. Certainly, the lepers did stand at a distance, but they lifted up their voices, saying, Jesus, Master, have mercy on us. They know their evil plight. They know the corruption of their flesh. And clearly, they have heard something about Jesus that has made them hope in Him. Therefore, they acknowledge their dependence on Him with their prayer, calling Him Master, and with their faith, they trust in him that he will do something to help. And the lepers are not disappointed. When Jesus sees them, he says, Go and show yourselves to the priests. Now we can understand those words as the good news that it is when we understand how lepers were cleansed in the Old Testament. If a leper... Excuse me. who lived outside the camp, suspected that his leprosy was beginning to clear up, the first thing that he did was go and show himself to the priests. And so when Jesus says, go show yourself to the priests, he's saying, your leprosy is getting better. It's healing. The priest would come to the leper and examine him, and if the priest found that the leprosy had indeed healed, then he would begin these certain cleansing rites. <coughs> Now, the rites were quite involved, but each part had its place. The priest would bring two live birds, cedar wood, scarlet yarn, and hyssop, and come to the leper outside the camp. He would command that one of the birds be killed over an earthenware vessel of fresh water. And then he would dip the living bird, the cedar wood, scarlet yarn, and hyssop into the bloody water and sprinkle seven times the person who was to be cleansed. Then the priest would pronounce him clean and let the living bird go in the open field. On that day and on the seventh day, the former leper would wash his clothes, shave his hair, and bathe. And then on the eighth day, the priest would bring him into the tabernacle and present a sin offering, a guilt offering, and a burnt offering. And then, he would have made atonement for the man. The man would be cleansed from his leprosy and restored to the society of God and men. This is the process that these lepers hurried off to begin. Except you'll notice that not a word of those cleansing rites comes up in our reading. Because as they went, they were cleansed. They were cleansed apart from these rites because they were cleansed by the one to whom all of those cleansing rites pointed. Ultimately, Jesus is the priest who left heaven and came to us outside the camp. And he is the bird that was killed for our cleansing. And he is the living bird that bore off our uncleanness away from us. And he is the one who has sprinkled us with the living waters of baptism and pronounced us clean. He's the one who has bathed us in fresh water, who has given us white robes, who has restored us to the society of God and gathered us into the congregation of saints. Now, this does not mean that we no longer have a sinful nature. You could say that the leprosy of our sin will stick and cling to our flesh up to the moment of death. But it does mean that we are cleansed by the blood of Jesus that we are holy and righteous 
in God's sight. And this is what Paul holds in tension, you could say, uh, as he examines himself in Romans chapter 7. He says, I see in my members another law waging war against the law of my mind and making me captive to the law of sin that dwells in my members. Wretched man that I am, who will deliver me from this body of death? Thanks be to God, through Jesus Christ our Lord. So then I myself serve the law of God with my mind, but with my flesh I serve the law of sin. Now Jesus cleansed these ten lepers before his death and resurrection, before he had baptized anyone in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And yet one of the lepers realizes that Jesus is the priest who has cleansed him. And he returns to him, praising God with a loud voice, and he fell on his face at Jesus' feet, giving him thanks. All ten realized that they were dependent on Jesus when they were unclean lepers, and they prayed to him. But only one realizes that he is still dependent on Jesus now that he has received the gift of cleansing, and he responds with thanksgiving. <clears throat> now it's worth our while to consider the place of thanksgiving in the Christian life, especially because there's often confusion in the church in our day about the purpose of praise and thanksgiving. I suspect that many people hear the words giving thanks and suppose that we're somehow benefiting Jesus in some way. Yet if we stop and think for a moment, however, we'll realize that Jesus doesn't need anything from us. It's simple presumption on our part to suppose that by giving him thanks we're doing him some sort of thing. Well, the question then is, why do we give thanks to Jesus? And there are two reasons. First, it's simply the obvious and right thing to do. Thanksgiving is honest. It gives credit where credit is due. Luther explains this in the small catechism under the first article of the Creed. He recounts how God created us, how he sustains us, how he defends us from all evil, and that he does it out of his fatherly divine goodness and mercy without any merit or worthiness in us. And then he says, for all this it is my duty to thank and praise, serve and obey. Thanksgiving is not repayment. How could we repay God for everything that he's done for us? It simply naturally follows from all that the Lord has done, just as an infant thinks more highly of his mother for nursing him, not less. Perhaps this makes more sense if we consider the opposite, the ridiculousness of ingratitude. Would it not be complete foolishness and pride if the infant received nourishment from his mother and then used that nourishment to convince himself, I no longer need my mother. I know, I know, five minutes ago I was crying and screaming in hunger, but now I've eaten and I can stand on my own two feet and I don't need good old mom. The lepers did the same thing. My leprosy is gone. I've been cleansed. Who needs Jesus anymore? And so you see that ingratitude is a lie. It's a symptom of unbelief, which likes to think that it has all good things from itself and is not dependent on anyone else. So that's the first and most obvious reason for giving thanks. It's the right and honest and proper thing to do. The second reason for giving thanks is that it orients us toward Jesus. Consider the position of the man who returned to Jesus. He's face down at Jesus' feet, pointed right at him. He's face down in humility, giving thanks for the gift he has received and acknowledging his unworthiness for receiving this gift of cleansing. And this is faith's response to Jesus' words. 
Faith understands that there's great danger with independence. Freedom from Jesus is not freedom at all, but slavery to sin. Self-sufficiency is an overrated delusion. And so faith is the infant who is content to say, I am completely dependent on my mother, and I wouldn't have it any other way. So the man is face down at Jesus' feet. And we see that this benefits the man, not Jesus. Because of this thanksgiving, the man actually receives more than the other nine did. Jesus tells this man, Arise! and declares, your faith has saved you. The others did not receive this exaltation, this assurance of salvation. And thus we see that rather than benefiting Jesus, thanksgiving actually benefits us. And this has always been the case. In the Old Testament, there was a certain sacrifice called the sacrifice of thanksgiving. An Israelite could bring an animal to the temple and offer it to the Lord, simply out of gratitude for what the Lord had done for him. The priest would take the kidneys and some other innards from the animal and burn those on the altar, and prepare the meat, and give the meat back to the one who brought the offering. No longer just plain meat, but now holy meat for the man and his family to eat in the presence of God in the temple. And this is what God does with thanksgiving. He receives it from us and turns it right around and gives us something even better. And we're about to see this happen. We're going to sing part of Psalm 116 after we collect the offering. I will offer the sacrifice of thanksgiving. And we can see the offering as part of our sacrifice of thanksgiving which we give to Jesus in thanksgiving for all of his benefits for us. And what is the first thing that Jesus does with this thanksgiving? He buys bread and wine for us, and gives it to us not just as bread and wine, but as his body and blood for the forgiveness of sins. Thus, the gracious work of Christ spurs us on to give thanks, and when we do give thanks, he takes our thanks and uses it as opportunity to be even more gracious to us. Well, let's sum things up. In today's account, we learn about the nature of sin, how it's something of a spiritual leprosy. We heard how Jesus cleansed us by his perfect sacrifice and through the waters of baptism. We learned about thanksgiving, how Jesus uses it as an opportunity to be gracious to us. And through all of this, we've seen how the Christian life is a life of dependence on Jesus. Our leprosy continues to cling to us. We can't even give thanks as we ought. But Jesus continues to cleanse us. And he presents us to himself holy and righteous without any blemish. He forgives you your sins, original sin, and all actual sins. And he will raise your flesh, whole and uncorrupt, on the last day. Amen. The peace of God which surpasses all understanding guards your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus.